All right. Hey, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and try something a little bit different today. I am um, I'm going, going to, to do, do a straight, straight talk, talk today. today. If, if you, you guys, guys are listening to this message, uh, it's, it's a pre-recorded, pre-recorded message. Most, Most likely, I am out of town right now. I'm either in another state, watch my son graduate uh, from the military, or I'm on a plane, plane headed back to Georgia. In any case, I wanted to come in here and just do this quick little, I guess not a quick little teaching, but just do a teaching for um, for you all for Sunday and just have that up there recorded. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to have as much of my... Um, animations and everything. I actually kind of just wanted to teach out the Bible a little bit. So I'll have a few uh, pictures and everything like that. I'm a visual guy, so I, I understand about um, illustrated teachings and all these things. But I just want to kind of just teach out the Bible and just be able to give you all a little bit of clarity like that. So um, if you all would, if you do have your Bibles, grab your Bibles and just go to Daniel chapter 7 for me. Just go to Daniel chapter 7. I just want to talk about a few things that have been on my heart, and I just want to um, just kind of share with you all, if that's okay, okay? So, um, like I said, just a little bit different today, but I just want to kind of just come from the Word of God, and hopefully we can get some understanding. So I'm going to go to Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. It says, in the first year of Belshazzar, which is Nebuchadnezzar's son, um, king of Babylon, this is the first year Daniel had a dream, and the visions passed through his mind as he was laying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of, of his dream. Now, one thing that's significant about this is it is the first year of Belteshazzar. Now, Belteshazzar didn't, didn't um, just have uh, one year. It was a little bit longer than that. Forgive me on the exact time frame, but... Um, Anyway, Daniel saw this particular time as, excuse me, Daniel saw this particular time as um, something significant. And this is one of the things that I want to um, bring out, is that Daniel was a true prophet. I, I hate the, that he's, he's labeled a minor prophet because he wasn't as big as Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all those, and Isaiah, because he didn't write a lot. But the stuff that you see in Daniel, especially Daniel chapter 11, it's, it's so profound, profound that it's like, this guy should have been called a major prophet. He just didn't have a lot of writings, but in my book, Daniel is a major prophet. He's one of my favorite prophets because he's just so down to earth, and I can, you can almost see his character when you read the book of Daniel, okay? Uh, so he was a man of excellence. But anyway, he had this prophetic vision before Belshazzar died. Now, Belshazzar died because he was mocking God by bringing in all the goblets and drinking from the goblets of, of, of the temple and then a hand wrote on the wall that said, many, many tekal parazim, which means you're found on the scales, you're lacking, your time for our kingdom is up, and it's going to be handed over to the Persians and all of that. But Daniel saw all of this before all of that happened. And so that's what makes it so interesting right here on how Daniel was so profound. So he saw this vision uh, in the first year. Verse 2 says, Daniel said, In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was four winds of heaven churning the great sea. Uh, and then he says, And four great beasts, uh, each different from the other, came from the sea. So he's talking about these four beasts that came out of the four winds. And we're going to kind of get into that a little bit. I just want to kind of just take my time and... My wife says sometimes that I talk fast, so I'm going to try to slow it down just a little bit just so you guys can get an understanding, but I don't want you to take too much time. But I want you all to recognize how the four winds came, and out of the four winds came these four beasts. Now, um, there's a lot of different ways of people interpreting the winds, but I want to really just focus on the beasts instead of the four winds. The four winds can be you know, know the, the different changes in the atmosphere it can be it can it can, it can be described as the different periods of, of time but, but the four beasts is, is, is significant so we're going to look, look at that the very first one is uh in daniel chapter 7 verse 4 says the first one was like a lion and it had wings as an eagle and i got that, that picture right there it had wings as an eagle i watched until its wings 
were torn off and it was lifted from the ground and it stood on its two feet like a man and the heart of a man was given to it so you got this lion right here with wings and this is a prophetic uh, picture of what he's you know what this is but it was a lion with wings but if you look at the beast is actually referred to as a a superpower now at this time uh, um, Daniel, Daniel was, was just, just taken, taken from, from his, his he, he wasn't, wasn't just, just taken, taken from his, his, his people, people from Israel but he's he been serving under Nebuchadnezzar all of this particular time and so their um, idol or their, their idol their image is a man with a lion's body with wings and, and so, so as, as you can, can see right here you have this vision that God has given him of a lion with wings and it was given he says a heart of a man which means that it was it was it was crafty like a man it wasn't a beast but it was like a man but it was it, it was the form of a lion with wings and so basically if you if you look at that that's basically saying it was a superpower of a nation that will take over the world now this lion with the wings is the first superpower which is Babylon now I taught on messages like this before but I want to kind of bring this out a little bit more because of a lot of people uh, have a lot of different questions and ideas and and um, debates, debates on when, when it comes, comes to the, the end times. And one, the, the end times is one of my favorite subjects to, to study on because, because you, you really can't say uh, who is 100% correct because it hadn't happened yet. You know, so there's, there's a lot of times when you can kind of stretch your your wings, so to speak, when, when it comes to revelation knowledge, when, when it comes to the, the last days. days. And so the, the first superpower was Babylon, which, which took over the whole world. world. And we, we know the story. If you know anything about Babylon, Babylon they were ruthless. You know, Nebuchadnezzar was like the like the god of this world. He took he took over the whole world. It was nobody on at that, that time that, that can match Nebuchadnezzar. He was he was the man. Nobody wanted to touch him. He, he took over the whole world and he was it was full of gold and splendor and, and you know so Babylon was was was, was the superpower, right? His son came, which was met um Belteshazzar after Nebuchadnezzar, you know, died. Um, but footnote, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, he ended up being a believer. Before he died, you, you can, can read, read that in Daniel, Daniel chapter four, where he wrote uh, Daniel chapter four is placed in the Bible and it's written by a heathen. But it's one of the most uh, prolific. It's one of the most uh, inspiring, you know, uh, verses or, or books or chapters in the Bible. And it's written by a, a person who we would say is, is an ungodly person. So it lets you know that God can redeem anybody, right? So his son. Um, Belteshazzar came out of Nebuchadnezzar and like, like I told you before the writing on the wall said that your time is up and it's going to be handed over to your, the, to to your neighbor um, and, and so the first beast was was that in chapter 4 and then he says verse 5 there before me was a second beast and the second beast looked like a bear it was raised up on its, high, on its side and it had three ribs in its mouth and, and, and between its teeth and it was told get up eat your fill of flesh so you see this bear as like the next uh, superpower and let me let me make sure I have my all right I hope you guys can hear me. I had my I had to fix my sound a little bit. I hope it sounds a little bit better because a lot of other times it had a little static to it. Okay, so um, so the second beast right here was a bear, and it had three ribs in its mouth. And so you guys just kind of just bear with me as I teach this a little bit because, you know, sometimes when you have these particular things in the Bible you kind of say well what does that mean and, and why am I reading this and this is boring and, but this is just so significant because he's talking about the bear that had three ribs in his mouth and he says get up and take your fill of flesh and this was another ruthless uh, kingdom that came after Babylon well I just told you before that when Belteshazzar died the person who 
Well, he actually died that night. Once, once the hand was writing on the wall and says, your time is up, Belteshazzar died that night. And the person who killed him was Darius, was, who was a Mede by genealogy. Now, Darius was a Persian, but he was genetically a, a, a Mede. And so when Darius killed Belteshazzar, he took over Babylon and it was now the Medes and the Persians. Or in other words, in this case, the Persians was the next superpower. Persia was, was, the, was the one that took over uh, Babylon after, after Nebuchadnezzar. And so they were, they were just as ruthless as well, you know. And, and, and when Daniel saw them in the prophetic, he saw them as a bear with, with three ribs in his mouth. And so um, I'm going somewhere with this because the reason why this subject is so important to me is because sometimes we see things that's right in front of our face, but we don't recognize the meaning. And there's a lot of prophetic things that's just happening that's in the Bible. And a lot of times we don't even recognize it. So let's, let's just keep going right here. So um, Persia was the next superpower. And then it goes and talks about right here. Uh, verse uh, six. After that, I looked and I saw before me another beast, one that looked like a leopard. And on his back, it had four wings like a bird. And the beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. So you got a leopard here with four heads and wings like a bird. In other words, it was swift. It was fast. And you can see a lot of this in, um, I think it's Daniel chapter eight. But let's just kind of just go right here. It had the leopard and it had uh, wings like a bird and it had four heads. Well, so after Babylon was taken over by the Persians, it's like who conquered Persia? And the people who conquered Persia was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, which was from uh, Greece. Greece was the next superpower. That's where you get the Spartans and you get all these other different people. And they had this, you know, it was so swift because Alexander the Great came in and he 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 basically conquered the whole world so fast. He was in his 30s when he died. And in fact, when he died, he wept on his deathbed because there was no more worlds to conquer because he, he did it so fast, you know, and that's that was spoken prophetically that it was the leopard with the with the wings of a bird and in other words he just came so swift that he like he wasn't even touching the ground basically um and so what does the four heads mean well after alexander the great died his kingdom was broken up into four parts four generals but they wasn't as strong as alexander was okay and so um at that time, you know, they were they were they were they were the top dog. They were the leopard. So in other words, the, you got the three winds and now you got the three beasts. These represents all these different times of periods. And it's, it's almost like it's shaping up into something. OK. And so let's look at the next thing right here is in uh, what was that? Verse seven. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast. Terrible terrifying and frightening and very powerful it had large iron teeth it crushed and devoured its victims it trampled underfoot whatever was left it was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns you see this beast you really couldn't even describe it. I know I got a picture right here and that kind of looks more like a dinosaur and sometimes people just kind of see it like that but it was basically a beast that you can't describe and you can't really just put your finger on it but one thing is for sure is the significance of iron that was around it. Iron teeth, bronze claws, it was like no other beast like 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 he's seen before in this in this vision right and so in it and it devoured everything this was the next superpower but it was it was the most dominant superpower and so that superpower is the mighty rome one thing about rome is that they always had iron they had iron breastplates they had iron shoes and and um you know the covered there their shins, they had iron helmets, you know everything about Rome. They they ruled for eight centuries, I believe it was, if I'm not mistaken. And so um, Rome was, was the one. Now, keep in mind, 
when Daniel saw this, none of this had happened. He was still in Babylon. This was still the first beast, the lion with the wings. And so for him to see all of this right now, let you know how truly profound and how truly prophetic Daniel was. And so everything that he's saying is trustworthy. Right. Because we can look back in history and, and say exactly this is what happened. Babylon was conquered by Persia. Persia was conquered by Greece. Now, Greece was conquered by Rome. And so if he's saying that right now and he's already batting 100 when it comes to prophetic, then that means everything he's saying after this is going to happen. It's, it may look a little symbolic, but it's going to happen. And we have to be like the Bible says. God says, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not see it? And a lot of times we kind of just look over these things because it's not headlining news, but it's it's behind the scenes happening right now. OK, so where was I at right there? And I think that's about all the pictures that I well, I got probably got one more picture. Um, it had 10 horns. Um, and it had it has his authority to rule. What right, I said in, in verse six, it had his authority to rule. And like I said, Rome. Um, lasted for at least eight centuries right and nobody conquered rome rome fell from its own moral decline they started embracing all kinds of ungodly demonic uh, occultic things and from the inside out they died caesar uh, was betrayed by all his generals and rome fell in one day right and um we can look back on history on that, but you can you know how ruthless Rome was. You see the Roman Colosseums. You saw Ben Hur. You saw some of these Roman movies. We you would see with all the blood gladiators and all that. Other stuff. That that really happened. They fed Christians to lions and all kinds of stuff. They were they trampled over everything, right? And they 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 fell in one day. And so what happened was. Um, these particular four beasts are significant because it's part of Satan's plan to merge all four of them into one, right? So look at verse um, seven. It says, after that, I looked. Let me, let me at right here. Okay. Uh, I got wrong right there. Verse seven says, after that, in my vision, while I was thinking, it says on this one, but I got a different translation. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there was a fourth beast terrifying. Oh, I said that. Verse eight. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little horn. Notice again, he's speaking prophetically, but he's speaking in symbols. But he said there was a little horn which came up from among them. From the which one? The one, the fourth beast, the Roman Empire, right? The one that had all the iron, the one that had the bronze teeth and everything. So he had the it had ten horns, but then it says there was a little horn which came up from among them, and three horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes and a and a man's mouth, and it spoke boastfully. So you got this horn right there that I got on your screen but it had eyes and it had mouth and it was talking and it was boastful in other words this was this was a portion of the roman empire rather by being in location or by bloodline but this particular horn came out of where's rome at rome is in italy right so this this horn came from um the descendants of rome was broken up. It had three other, and, it, and it's going to explain all of this because I don't want to just jump around too much, but I do want to just read the Bible when it comes to this because um, it's a lot to be said in here. So let me just go ahead and read because I think the Bible can just explain itself. Um, I'm going to move to verse because verse nine talks about how um, you know the ancient of days talking about God has has sat down and. He sees all of these things and he got 10,000. In fact, it just said in verse 10, the rivers of fire were flowing, coming out before him, talking about God. Uh, thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 or 10,000 uh, times 10,000 stood before him and the courts were seated and the books were open. That simply means that all of this stuff that was happening was not surprising God. The court was seated. Everything was going according to plan. This was something that's supposed to have happened. Now watch this. Um, 
Let me go down to verse 11. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and his body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. Talking about the beast itself was thrown into the fire, but the horn wasn't, right? The other beasts had been stripped of their authority and they were, they were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was like a son of man coming from the clouds. He approached the ancient of days, led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, men, everywhere, language, worship him. His dominion is everlasting dominion, and it will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Talking about Christ right there. Okay. I want to kind of move down a little bit because as much as it talks about God's majesty, he wanted you to let you know that God was in control. No matter how bad everything is getting, God is in control. So um, I'm going to move down to verse 23. Now, I do encourage you to read all of, of Daniel chapter 7, but I'm going to go down to verse 23. He gave the, so in other words, uh, Daniel was, had an angel guide and he asked the angel basically, what, what is, what is that over there? What is that horn? And what, what is so significant about that? So verse 23 says, he gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and it will devour the whole earth, trampling it down and crushing it. Verse 10, verse 24, the 10 horns are the 10 kings or I think it's, or it can be Caesars, I guess, uh, who will come from this kingdom. And after them, in other words, after they are complete, uh, in other words, it's not, it's not like back to back to back. It's like those 10 are done and there's some space. And then here comes another one. And he says, after they will complete, another king will arise different from the, uh, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. He will speak against the most high and oppress his saints, right? And try to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for times, times, and half a time. That's basically talking about three and a half years. Some commentaries will say that uh, for a year, two years, or, or two and a half years. But in Revelation, it's talking about the half of the tribulation period, which is seven years half of that is three and a half years so it's basically a ballpark between no more than three and a half years between two to three and a half years this guy will have dominion and he will oppress the saints so there will be this kind of persecution coming from this little horn that that is an enemy of god's people he hates god he hates god's people he will change laws he will change times and things that were set in order to uh, go against and go against God and go against God's people. Now, why do I say things like this? Because we're living in a times when you can start seeing the lawlessness start happening now. There are, there are laws that's being made that's going against God and going against godly people. And what happens is you're going to start seeing uh, a lot of dif these different people who come to power and people are always saying, oh, that's, that's the Antichrist. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to show you that that's, that's not so much the Antichrist, but it is the spirit of Antichrist that is working in the, the children of disobedience. So watch this. He said they will speak against that and then the saints will be handed over to him. But watch this in verse 26. It says, but the court will sit and his power will be taken away. Well, let me stop right there. Let me go back. But the court will sit. Talking about God. In other words, this stuff that's happening is not shocking God at all. He's still sitting down and letting this play out. This is part of the process. Sometimes people say, well, God, how come you're not saying anything? How come you're not doing anything? This is when it says the court will sit. It's almost like when they go to recess, recess, no judgments are made. We're just going to just let this happen until we pick it up later on. And that may sound a little bit harsh but it's almost like god is saying you got enough power inside of you to wait this this out and it's not that god is saying that aha you thought and 
you should have you should have no it's not that it's the same thing that will kind of like happen in revelations when he said the saints were praying and he he gave him a white sheet and said you need to wait a little bit longer in other words i'm going to give you the strength to endure so there will be times where the saints at this particular time will be going through such a persecution and they have to kind of just wait it out you're going to see a lot of bloodshed you're going to see a lot of injustice you're going to see a lot of things that go against the body of christ but you're going to have the strength to endure now the bible said the course will sit and its power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty and power of greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints. Right? It'll be handed over to the saints. If you can endure to the end, you will be saved. The people of the Most High. Right? So the kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom and all the rulers will worship and obey him. Talking about the Lord. Then he says in verse 28, this is the end of the matter. I, Daniel, was deeply troubled by my thoughts and my face turned pale, but I kept the matter to myself. In other words, Daniel was saying that this was a this was a, a hard thing to watch, but I have the I'm just going to kind of just keep this to myself because I know in the end we're going to be victorious. Now, Daniel was speaking as an Old Testament prophet. He didn't he had the quote unquote he had the Holy Spirit, but he didn't have that baptism of the Holy Spirit that came after the day of Pentecost. But he had the Holy Spirit on him and he wrote these things inspired by God so that we can kind of uh, gain benefit from that. Now, the reason why I went to Daniel is because I think again, he's one of my favorite prophets in the, in the Bible, but. I want to kind of just piggyback that with what's happening today. And so I don't know if I got a lot of time, but you all will be fine if you just kind of just wait around. Um, look at this real quick. I'm going to go to Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. Now, before I go there, um, I just want you all to know that when it comes to end time prophecies, when it comes to, you know, all of these particular words when it comes to the end times there's a lot of different debates on who uh who's the antichrist uh when is the rapture will there be a rapture um will we go through a tribulation all of these different questions and i i believe the bible explains itself i can i can take you to a certain scriptures but i think for the time's sake i'm just going to just quote it um if you look at god's method if you look at god's history if you look at god's ways the bible says my ways are not your ways my thoughts are not your thoughts if you look at god's ways you will see that god never changes or deviates from what he has already done before so if he done something before it will be established that way because god does not lie and god does not change now he may change the package when it comes to certain things but the but the core of what god does does not change so when the lord said that he's going to destroy the world with the flood and he told Noah to preach for 120 years that it's going to rain and at that time there was no such thing as rain but Mo Noah had a prophetic word to tell the people it's going to rain but only eight people were saved of his family everybody else perished right so why didn't why did God in the first place tell Noah to preach if he was going to destroy the whole world in the first place well God want to give people a way out God want to give people space to repent God sat down in the course and waited what is he waiting on he's waiting for the full measure of the Gentiles I would say or the full measure of the sinners to to wake up and to make their way their way in because it's going to get real bad now what happens is the Lord told Noah that it's going to rain and I want you to build an ark so that you can preserve your life and the animals that I will cause to come in there. So Noah didn't pick his own animals. God chose them and then they started walking into the ark and they went right into their room and they just sat there until the rain came. Right. So most Noah was just sitting there just building the ark and God let him build all the way up until the day where it began to rain and then Noah and his family went in there and God closed them in so what am I saying he sealed that door and then it started to rain and the rest of the people you know the story they started beating on the door and said let us in but it was too late then so 
my point is saying is that before destruction comes, God will always preserve his people so they don't have to go through the turmoil that the world is going through. Jesus said it like this. He says, because you kept my commandments, I will keep you from the whole hour uh, of temptation that's going to come upon the whole world. So in other words, God is always saying, I'm going to give you a way out before it gets bad. You know, he done the same thing with Lot. He said the same thing with Abraham. He done it with Lot. He told them to get out the city, do not look back. And he preserved them so that before destruction came, they were already out the city. Same thing with Israel. Same thing with, you know, Joseph and the famine and, and Moses and the Red Sea and all of these different things, these plagues. And God will preserve people who have his heart so that they don't have to go through that. Now, they're not, they kind of have an advantage they're not exempt from the world stuff. They got an advantage because God gives them a heads up. And I believe the same thing that's happening now is that before things get bad, God will give the people of God a heads up and he will give them a way of escape that they don't have to go through the same thing that the whole world's going through. Now, keep in mind, there will be a tribulation that's going to hit the whole world. And the Bible says that it's especially going to go, it's going to hit hard when it comes to the saints. Now, People call tribulation all kinds of things. They go through a little job loss and they say they, they're going through the tribulation. No, I mean, this this will be a tribulation that that is re a real tribulation. But I want to go to Second um, Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. Uh, it says concerning the, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers, do not become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, letters supposed to have been from us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. So in other words, just like how they had false prophets way back then and they had false prophets during uh, Paul's day, we got false prophets right now. So there always will be this kind of counterfeit word before the real word. Let me blow this because my... Uh, fan is blowing my pages so you got this counterfeit word and you have this real word and so what happens is you have people that was just kind of saying all kinds of things and if you don't know your bible you're going to follow anything that sounds good that's why i keep telling people that it's nothing wrong with listening to inspirational people but you better make sure they're in the bible because there's a lot of inspirational people in Paul's day who can preach better than Paul, but they were not rooted and grounded in the word of God. One of the things that I try to make sure I'm always doing anytime I get before God's people is making sure that you are getting scripture on what I'm saying. I don't have enough things to say to inspire people. I, I, I rely on the word of God. And those of you all that, that follow and listen to this ministry, you have an appetite for the word of God as well, because the people that usually listen to the teachings like me, they're they're like students. They're not church folks. You're more like students who try to learn more. So that's why it's very important in these last days that you have the knowledge of God, the knowledge of his word and the knowledge of, of how he does things. Because if not, you'll just start thinking that God will do anything that you think because it because it sounds like, oh, that's God or this is good. And you just start assuming, but it's not backed up by the word. So I believe that the Lord is going to, when he talks about the day of the Lord and talking about us being gathered to him, he is speaking of the rapture. Now, the word rapture is not in the Bible per se is as the term rapture but neither is the word trinity and neither is the word bible you know so all of these things does that just because you don't see the word rapture does not mean that it's not there but the, the word being caught up to be gathered means to to, to rapture to, to to pull and to gather together so that's what he's that's what he's saying right here all right so he said don't be easy upset and today, by some prophecy or some report, some letter written by us saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Uh, he says, verse three, that is deceiving. He said, do not let anyone deceive you in any way. Matthew chapter 24, I believe. He says, when will these signs happen? And then he, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, be careful that nobody deceives you. In other words, the very first sign 
of the, the of, of the end is deception. Deception is the main thing that is that is a, a major sign of the end. Deception is also the main weapon that Satan uses. If you take away his deception, you have taken away Satan's power. If you go back to the Garden of Eden, the only tool that Satan used to get them to eat the fruit was deception. That's all he used was just deception. And then he he, he got all the authority that man had. And so the Bible talks about in Revelation that he talks about that when when the dragon talking about Satan was bound by chains, he was thrown into the bottomless pit so he will not deceive the nations anymore. So when you shut down his deception, the Bible said they had a thousand years of peace. Why is that? Because when you take away deception, you have taken away Satan's power. So going back right here. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse three said, do not let anybody deceive you. Deception is going to be one of those things that's going to be recurring. And it's, just, it's going to be so much deception that you don't even know which way is right now. We got we living in times where people think that men can get pregnant. We living in times right now when people feel like they can be anything without except for what God made them. We living in times right now where you think that you can just do all kinds of crazy stuff and that it, and that it's OK. We are living in deceptive times right now. And the thing that I'm trying to tell you is that it's going to get worse. You think it's bad now when they said it's OK for you to murder your children or you can engage in homosexuality. All these things that God is against. You think it's bad now? Wait till deception really starts having its full effect. We're just we're just still at the, the tip of the iceberg of deception. But the world will be full of deception. And the only thing that's going to ground the people of God is the word of God. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until there is a falling away or a rebellion or a, um, it says rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed that the man doomed to destruction. The gathering of the saints will not happen until there's a great falling away and a man of lawlessness is revealed now somebody says okay so it looks like we're gonna it's like we're gonna be taken away first and then all this other stuff is gonna happen does it did it did it say that or did it say it will not happen until this happens here's here's the point a lot of times we try to debate and fight over which comes first. I don't think that's really important, but for the sake of the argument, I will deal with that. But I think the main thing is you better make sure that you're on that train when it comes. Because when if you you better pray that your flight is not in the winter, like Jesus said, you better make sure you don't miss your flight. Now, at the time of this teaching that you all are watching this, I'm probably on a plane right now coming back to Georgia. But. You have to get to the airport early. You have to prepare. You have to make sure you're paying attention to your ticket. You got to make sure you're doing all of these different things so that you won't miss out on what God is doing. Now, if my if my microphone goes out, I'll pause it for a second and then I'll just, um, you know, go and and change out the microphone. But hopefully I got some time. OK, so he says right here, um, what was that? Verse five. No, I'm almost on verse five. Let's read that again. Verse four. He will. OK, yeah. Verse three, he talks about the man of lawlessness is revealed who was doomed to destruction. So we know right here that it's going to be deception. We know there's going to be rebellion or a fallen away. And then we know that the man of lawlessness or the son of perdition or the antichrist man will be revealed. So being revealed is different than just um, saying that, oh, that's that, you know, I believe this person. No. You will know who the Antichrist is during this particular time. Look at verse four. He will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped. Right. So that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Now, at, the, at this time in history, people. They call themselves God. You got some musicians, people who call themselves God and everything, but it's not on a level like a, a person in a political thing will call himself God and then go to the t temple, go to Israel, go to these sacred places and sit in God's temple and say that I am God. You don't see stuff like that. That's kind of mind boggling. But I'm telling you, this is where the world is going to go. And one day you're going to hopefully you don't see this, but one day People are going to see this person actually do this. Now, right now, it's like almost like that's mind blowing. But the world is going to be so much deceived that they will just believe anything. Right. 
So does that come first or that comes second? Let's look at verse five. He says, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things. This is Paul talking about that. I talked to you all about this, but there's a way where you'll start to forget or you'll start to not connect the dots. So he had to keep reminding them almost like what I messages like this. I, I recur it more and more because people kind of forget what were the stages that now again going back to Daniel there were these four winds representing these times and then you had these four beasts that represent these superpowers and then after that time was done after the ten kings from the from the ten horns of the fourth beast was done there was this gap and then there was this other horn that came from that source right and um, it's a lot that I can say about this but I'm just gonna just read the Bible um, hmm Verse five, Do, don't you remember that when I was with you, I will tell you these things. And now you know what is holding him back. Now, I want you to kind of zero in on verse six when he says, now you know what's holding him back. What do you mean now I know what's holding him back? I don't, I don't know what's holding him back. Well, think about it. What or who, he says, you know what is, what is now holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. So this gap, and it's almost like, what do you mean what's holding him back? Do you mean to tell me there's something holding him back? Yes, there's something that's holding him back. Um, you just think about it. If you're living in a time right now, and it's like it's bad out there, and everybody's going crazy, and everybody's doing this, and everybody is, you know, having all this. Just look at our culture right now. What do you think is holding the 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 craziness back i mean they're making when it comes to the political spectrum and even when it comes to the church you got all kinds of craziness i saw a video when they had drag queens in a church walking down the aisle and saying it's drag queen sunday and it's like really are we are we are we doing that now but what do you think is holding back all the craziness don't you think that if something was not holding it back, then they will go as crazy and as far as they can. But isn't there some kind of resistance that's stopping this from going forward? I think it is. And I think you know what it is, too. Because the only thing that's really stopping the craziness from going forward is good people. But most importantly, the, the, the main thing that's stopping it is not only good people, but godly people. Good, godly people. In other words, saints are holding this lawlessness back and when jesus said in john uh in the later books of john he breathed on his disciples and he said receive the holy spirit and he breathed on them and they had the holy spirit and, and he said the holy spirit will be with you forever he will never be taken away he will never come in for a moment and then just leave you can never lose the holy spirit once you have him he's there now, that's not going on the doctrine of once saved, always saved. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. When you have really, when you have really been born again, if you have really tasted the goodness of the Lord, you won't go back to the world when you have really been born again. Some people just make a confession or they make a decision, but they never really gave their heart to the Lord. And that doesn't mean that you're saved. It just means that you went and did a certain form of godliness. But that doesn't mean you are born again because you got to be born by the Spirit. So what's holding him back? The Bible talks about that is basically the Holy Spirit is holding him back. But the Holy Spirit is made up inside of the body of Christ, the saints. The Holy Spirit lives in us. He's not outside on trees or clouds and everything. In the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And then God said, let there be light. But then when Jesus came, he, he breathed the Holy Spirit on you. And he says, whatever you bind on earth should be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth should be loose in heaven. I've given you the keys to the kingdom. And so now we have the Holy Spirit and we operate in a kingdom area to go against things that are lawlessness, things that are against God. And so the main thing that's holding back the antichrist or the lawlessness or all of this deception is the church, the body of Christ. We are holding him back. So watch this. Look at it, verse six. And now you know what is holding him back. Talking about the body of Christ, the church. 
so that he may be revealed at the proper time. In other words, we're holding him back until the proper time. Well, what is the proper time then? Verse seven, for the secret power of lawlessness or the secret power of, of um, Antichrist is an Antichrist spirit. The secret power of the Antichrist is already at work. The secret power of lawlessness is already happening right now. You can look on the news. You can look outside. You can go to your job. You can see all of the lawlessness that's already there. That is the spirit that's setting the stage for the man. Just like in Genesis chapter 1, before God created man, he created the atmosphere first. He created water. He created light. He created animals. He created trees. He created grass. He created all these things. And on the sixth day, he created man. That's why six is the number of man. But it was complete. Man was the final thing because God set the atmosphere first. Then he set the man in the middle of the garden to take care of it and to, and to till it. And then, and then God rested on the seventh day. Same thing with what, what Satan's going to do. He's going to set the atmosphere first and make sure it's all lawlessness, make sure it's all deception, make sure it's all perversion, make sure it's all, you know, wickedness. And then he will set the man in the middle of the garden because by the time he shows up, he's going to be just like the rest of the world. He's going to be one of them. He is not going to be some foreign guy. And you're like, ooh, this guy is weird. I don't know about. No, he's going to be just like them. He's going to be their champion because you got to set the stage first before you set the man in. And so the stage is being set right before your eyes. Just look on your phone. You can see lawlessness is at work. And what is it doing? It is setting the stage for the man. Okay. Again, my, my microphone may be going out. I hear it um, doing this, but it's only the battery is going a little low. Maybe I can make it all the way to the end. If it gets too crazy, then I'll, then I'll switch it. So just bear with me. Okay. I'm almost there. Verse seven says, for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but those who, but, okay, let me read that again, because I got to take this a little slow. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back, who's the one that's holding it back? The body of Christ, the Holy Spirit, us, the saints, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so. Why? Because you're going to keep on pressing against this thing. It will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. He, the Holy Spirit, who lives where? In you. He will continue to push back lawlessness until he, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. Now, will God ever take the Holy Spirit from you? No. Will God give you something and then take it back? No. If you ask for the Holy Spirit, will God give you a stone? No. If you ask for bread, will he give you a stone? When you ask for a fish, will he give you a serpent? No. If he gives you the Holy Spirit, he gives it to you. And the gifts and callings of God are without repentance, which means he's never going to take it back. If God ever gives you something, he's never going to take it back. And he, the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit, lives in you. So when he gave the Holy Spirit to you, he's just like he's given a gift to you. But it's, it's a he, it's him. Is a part of God that you can contain inside of your physical body because you can't contain the full part of God, God the Father, because you, you can't stand in front of his presence and live. But God the Son, which is the one who died on the cross, you know, you can handle that. And, you, you know, we pray to we pray to God in the name of Jesus. But when the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is in you. So when he says that he will continue to hold back lawlessness until he is taken out of the way, when God takes the Holy Spirit out of the way, he's actually taken him and you at the same time because you are one. So this will explain that you, the body of Christ, if you are a real body of Christ, you will not see the, the Antichrist because you're holding, you're holding him back. And by the time God takes you out of the way, because he knows it's going to get even worse, when he takes you out of the way, the Bible says he will do so until he was taken out of the way. Verse 8 says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. See, this is why I believe that the body of Christ is not going to go through the tribulation, just like how they didn't go through the flood, just like how they didn't go through the, the other parts in the Bible where God kind of just spared them. If God's methods is I'm going to I know which ones are mine and the Lord knows how to rescue those that are his. 
So he takes his people out the way and then he's going to let the world have it. And you know what? At that time, the world's going to be like, good. These Christians, they've been getting on my nerves anyway. Let them leave. They're going to be so happy that we're gone because no more resistance. You can make as many crazy laws if you want to. You can have sex with monkeys and horses and everything else and, and make it a law because there's nobody resisting it anymore. So you will have your full, your feel of all this lawlessness. And then the man of lawlessness will be like, just like one of these Caesars, just like one of these Nebuchadnezzar's, just like one of these Alexander the Great's, just like one of these, you know, Persia, uh, Darius and all these, all these guys, these Cyrus guys. Why? Because the world is set up for that. And so that's why you, the body of Christ, cannot afford to compromise your salvation by just doing anything that you feel like doing, um, you know, going the ways of the world. You have to always resist because the Holy Spirit inside of you is causing you to resist. That's why you can't swallow some of that stuff, even though they're saying it and it may sound right. There's something inside of you that says, hmm. I can't I can't do this. I can't do this. Why? That's the Holy Spirit inside of you. And so that's pushing back that lawlessness. I'm almost done. Verse eight. And the lawless, the lawless one. Um, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth or the sword of the spirit, which is in Revelation chapter 22, I think it is out of his mouth and destroy it by the splendor of his coming so that antichrist guy he will reign for a while and he will have victorious over the saints now somebody says what do you mean saints i thought we'd taken that away well there are people who will miss the train they will they will miss their flight and once they miss their flight, they're going to wake up and say, oh, my goodness, grandma was right. Oh, my goodness, pastor was right. Oh, my goodness, my wife was right. And then they're going to start to re they're going they're going to um, rededicate their lives. And it's going to be a great awakening in the tribulation. But it's going to be a whole lot harder for them to be Christians because you've got this whole lawless society and this king lawless man who was against the saints, according to Daniel chapter, uh, what was that? Seven? Was it Daniel chapter seven? Yeah. So it's going to be a lot harder. So he's going to be against those saints that are living in a tribulation because he couldn't get to us, the one that was holding him back because we're taken out the way. But the rest of the people that are still left behind, they got to go through this thing. They will, it's going to be a whole lot harder for them. You think it's hard now finding a good church or finding places of worship. Wait till everything is shut down and all the laws are against the body of Christ and against the word of God and all these different things. You remember in the dark ages when they were burning Bibles and they was, they was killing Christians and hunting them down and everything like that. And you had to be a secret saint. Well, those days will return. Right now, the spirit is kind of setting the stage. But one day that will be a reality. Verse 9. The coming of the lawless one will be like in accordance with the work of Satan. Display with all kinds of counterfeit miracles. Signs and wonders. This guy's going to be Satan's son. This guy's going to be Nebuchadnezzar, Alexander the Great, Darius, um, all the Caesars of Rome, all mixed into one guy. And he's going to be. I don't think he's going to be some gruesome looking creature like I am the Antichrist. No, I think he's going to be very, very handsome. He's going to speak well. He's going to be maybe something that everybody would accept. You know, he'll probably be something that, you know, the LGBT people would love. The, uh, you know, people of color would love the, you know, everybody will love him. The whole world will love him. He will, he will be on all the magazines. He will be on all the talk shows. Everybody will be talking about how great this guy is. And he will be the son of Satan. So people says, well, I know who the Antichrist is. Is this person? No, you don't know who the Antichrist is, according to Second Thessalonians chapter two, because right now the church is still on the on, on, still got boots on the ground until we are taken out of the way. Then you're going to see who the Antichrist is. But the Antichrist is not going to be here while we're here because we are too busy holding him back. When all the restraints are gone, then you'll see them. You better hope and pray that you don't be around when that happens, though. Verse 9, 
The coming of the lawless one will be like the accordance of the work of Satan displayed all kinds of counterfeit miracles. Yeah, he's going to do signs and miracles. They even make stuff come down from the sky. All right. Um, verse 10. And in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. We got to read that again. Verse 10. In every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth. And so be saved because they don't want the word of God, because they think you preachers are dumb. You churches are dumb. I don't want nothing from you. They have a spirit of delusion on them and they're going to swallow anything. This thing says anything. This spirit says because they are so disconnected from the truth that anything else that goes against what they think they are hostile to it. Don't you see what's happening now? You can't even get in a small little friendly debate with somebody without them being angry because you don't think the way I think. Well, get ready. It's going to be like that more and more and more. All right. Every sort of evil that deceives people every in every sort of evil that deceives. In other words, it's not just one thing. It's every kind of thing that's deception. He's going to be using that because if you take away Satan's power of deception, you took away his power. But you you let deception be on full display with no restraints, with nobody holding them back. Oh, you're going to have you. You, you you're going to see how far human nature can go. If you look at some of the stuff they did in Rome. And every single one of those Caesars were pedophiles, pedophilers and, and, and sleeping with boys and everything. And they let all kinds of perverse stuff go in. And that, and that was back then. Imagine what's going to happen now with all the technology on his side. All right. Every sort of evil and they refuse to love the truth. So be saved. Verse 11. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion, a spirit of delusion so that they will believe the lie. That's God is allowing it to happen because they don't want to hear the truth. So God said, I will turn you over into a reprobate mind so that you can do those things that are not that does not need to be done. For this reason, God will send them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And so that watch this verse 12, because my battery is about to go out. And so that they will be condemned who have not believed the truth. But stand, but but have delighted in wickedness. There's a lot of people to this day who are delighting in wickedness. And what I want to do, I just want to bring this teaching now because this is something that's always on my heart. When I'm driving down the road and I'm looking at different things, I see people who delight in wickedness. And they will look at you like you're the bad guy because you're going to speak out against it. Well, I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. In the last days, people will not want to hear what you have to say. And you have to have tough skin because we have entered into a time already and the time is already here that if you're going to be the body of Christ, it's time for you to, to, to I'm going to use the word man up. It's time because what happens is we're in a war, but we don't even know it. We think we fight against political people. We think we fight against church people. We think we're fighting. No, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against principalities. So that's why I ask that the eyes of your understanding be open. That you can see what is the what is the good and the perfect will of God. Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Because I don't want to be one of those people that spend my whole life studying the word of God and I'm
Lord, I just pray, God, right now, God, that you allow them. This is what I hear God saying, that the fire, don't let the fire burn out. You have probably been drifting away, and your fire is slowly to, 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 to burn out. But I blow on the fire right now in the name of Jesus. I know that looks a little foolish, but in the spirit, I blow on your fire. Share this.